I say what your mother has, at the very least, is what we call borderline personality disorder. A borderline personality disorder. Let me read to you from the DSM-4, okay? Definitions of the condition. These people have no love or compassion. Borderline personalities are very good at splitting behavior, creating bitterness and conflict between others in their circle. <laughs> Twisted freaking. That's my mother we're talking about, not some freak up in Attica. Stab you in the shower. A person with borderline personality disorder, or BPD, may experience intense bouts of anger, depression, and anxiety that may last only hours or most a day. Music sensations Britney Spears, Amy Winehouse, and Courtney Love are all assumed to have BPD as well as NFL wide receiver Brandon Marshall, author Zelda Fitzgerald, Princess Diana, Marilyn Monroe, Christina Ricci, Kurt Cobain, Lindsay Lohan, Angelina Jolie, and Winona Ryder. For numerous reasons, borderline personality disorder, this serious and epidemic mental illness, is almost impossible to locate and define. It is like a sophisticated cancer living in its host, undetected. Because we can't isolate it, it remains a disease that is difficult to treat. So let's look a bit at the inconsistencies, the paradoxes, and the catch-22s of this disorder. Let's begin with a simple but perplexing problem. More than any other diagnosis, people diagnosed as borderline are more often than not also diagnosed with other disorders. This is called comorbidity. 87% of people with BPD are also diagnosed as suffering a disorder of mood. 66% are diagnosed as suffering a generalized anxiety disorder. Another 61% are diagnosed as having a panic disorder. And, amazingly, 82% are diagnosed as suffering from other personality disorders. With all these other disorders in place, how can we detect what action and what behavior is rooted in the disease of borderline personality and what action or behavior is rooted in another illness? For example, someone might harm themselves through superficial cutting of their wrist to calm themselves from anxiety Yet the same behavior is tightly associated with BPD. Another person might withdraw from others due to a depression, then cling to these others, desperately intent on getting help from them. But the same person can easily be diagnosed as exhibiting the relational push and pull associated with BPD. Because of comorbidity, the problems in identifying the exact symptoms and the roots of these symptoms in borderline personality disorder are endless. Here is another problem with identifying this disease, a sister we could say to the problem of comorbidity. This is the problem of diagnostic permutations. For someone to be legitimately diagnosed as suffering the borderline illness, he or she must meet five of nine diagnostic criteria. This poses a quandary based on math. Choosing five criteria out of nine leads to 126 possible combinations. 
Because of this massive diversity of combinations, some clinicians have suggested that borderline personality disorder be broken down into subtypes. But how many subtypes would actually solve the problem of such diversity? One legitimate answer would be 126, leading to an entire manual just for this disorder. Think of it this way. Two people can be diagnosed as suffering borderline personality disorder and share only one common symptom. Say you wanted to hold a group therapy for people suffering BPD, and each individual needed to meet five of the nine criteria for the disorder. In this group might be one person who suffered from paranoia, unstable relationships, instability in mood, inappropriate anger, and impulsive, violent behavior. And next to this person would be another person who suffered from an identity disturbance, fears of abandonment, recurrent suicidality, chronic feelings of emptiness, and impulsivity related to shopping. Would these two individuals have much in common with each other? Likely not. The multiple diagnostic permutations related to BPD lead to a central problem in treating this disease. There is no one marker describing this disorder, no clear indication of what it is, no there we can call there. Let's take a moment to review. The thought is chilling. Here we have a serious disease attacking our population in epidemic proportions that can mask itself as other illnesses through comorbidity and can disseminate amongst the population in such diverse ways that it is hard to identify and thus target. Lastly, it's an illness that no researcher or scientist has been able to describe as one thing, leaving us with nine categories often unrelated to each other. Perhaps if we look a bit at how these categories were developed, we might find something like the nucleus of this problem, its center, the part of it that makes BPD an actual phenomenon. In 1980, the introduction of borderline personality disorder into the DSM also introduced a new way of discovering mental disorders. The framers of the DSM scanned the literature on borderline personality disorder and developed a list of behaviors associated with this disorder. They then mailed 4,000 questionnaires to a random sample of therapists asking these therapists to score which behaviors they felt most represented the clients they referred to as borderline. The nine categories came from these sources. So here we have it, the genesis of the disorder, a very interesting and novel way to define a term, where in most of our language we discover something new first by sight or sound or taste, then find or develop a word for it, the borderline diagnosis takes on opposite tact, beginning with a word, then searching for what it means. This way of research seems easy if the topic has some clarity to it. Say we asked all the therapists to review a list of what it means when they use the word cow we likely would come up with a solid understanding. But when the issue is a series of behaviors, it becomes much more difficult. It is an act of taking the round peg of verbs and putting them in the square hole of nouns. In this light, borderline is a word not unlike torture or pornography. We know it when we see it. A word that came first that refers to an illness we can't describe, affecting people in diverse ways and mimicking other illnesses. The borderline disease is at the top of its evolutionary game, thriving and surviving by sophisticated 
camouflage. In fact, and perhaps most frightening, it is chameleon-like, remarkably able to mimic normal human behavior. I fall into opposite extremes. I hate going to the office so much that I often come home sick. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, comes a phase of skepticism and indifference. Everything in my life comes in phases. And I mock my own intolerance and squeamishness, accusing myself of being dramatic Either I don't want to talk to any of my colleagues or I get into a talking streak and even take it into my head to make friends with them. For no apparent reason, all my squeamishness suddenly disappears. Who knows? Perhaps I never felt it at all. Perhaps it was all pretense. I even become altogether chummy with them, visit them at home, play preferences and discuss office politics. In just under a minute, the man in the previous recording presents not only with five of the criteria for BPD, but two other borderline symptoms, splitting and distress intolerance, noted extensively in the literature. This man, however, is a fictional character, the underground man from Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground. And here's the rub. While the underground man does appear to suffer from the symptoms of BPD, Dostoevsky was writing about the general human condition, a portrait of humans as irrational, uncontrollable, and uncooperative animals. In fact, his book is considered anti-utopian, pointing out that human needs can never be fully satisfied and that people will always live in a state of chaos and dissatisfaction. That sort of argument, that the opposite of a personality disorder, an ordered personality, is impossible to achieve, makes our quest to identify this serious illness quite difficult. How, in other words, do we separate borderlines as in a distinct category, different from us healthy individuals. Let's look a little more deeply at this paradox. Gazing through Dostoevsky's eyes, we could say that being human is not easy. We can even say that it is a dis-ease to live as a human being. This disease can even be broken down into categories. The categories are as follows. Number one, merger and separation. Human beings are social and cultural animals dependent on one another for survival. They are thus generally anxious regarding disconnection with others, especially their intimates. On the other hand, they also evidence the capacity to risk the loss of connection, often standing up for what they believe in, despite the possibility of rejection. Number two, the unpredictability of connection. Because humans live on the line between separation and merger, their connection with each other always threatens with instability. Humans are constantly looking for closeness while also protecting themselves from merging so much that they lose their identities. While unstable in their interpersonal relationships, human beings often feel most at peace in the presence of intimates. Number three, the flux of identity. Human beings experience their identities as persistently unstable. 
While this is a source of great anxiety, the flexibility of identity is also one of the great modern human freedoms. Indeed, it is the central psychological gift of the modern era. Modern human beings value the notion of being self-made, and they find joy in the creation and ever-changing nature of identities. Number four, impulsivity and creativity. Human beings are often impulsive. Sometimes this impulsivity is self-damaging, as if some destructive and uncivilized monster is loose. Other times, it is the wellspring of spontaneous and remarkable play. Without impulsivity and its sisters of spontaneity and play, there would be no inspiration, no invention, no creativity. Impulsivity is central to being human. Without it, we are robots. Number five, the unpredictability of mood. Human beings experience changing and unpredictable moods, for they are the source of tremendous energy and urges, some destructive, others creative. Our changing moods make our lives novel, always new and exciting. Number six, emptiness and solitude. Human beings often feel empty inside, yet also face the world with great wonder and awe. They long for intimate connections with others, fear the loss of these connections, yet also find pleasure in moments of solitude. Number seven, trust and distrust. Human beings can be irrationally distrusting of others to the point of deep paranoia. When this distrust and paranoia becomes pervasive, they are known to become violent. When it is shared between people, they have evidenced a tendency to segregate each other or even initiate mass killing and genocide. Humans are a self-destructive lot. Yet despite their failings as communal animals, humans are also imbued with the enduring ability to generate faith and trust in the face of insecure and dangerous situations. Faith and trust in each other are always a challenge for humans. In fact, they have built grand institutions to support and weave a trusting social fabric, political and judicial systems, and places of worship, while all imperfect, are created to support our struggle to trust and cooperate with one another. Number eight, anger and control. While they have the tendency to lose their temper and become irrational, human beings are equally contemplative and self-reflective, often finding humor in their own frailty. Number nine, the choice to end one's life. Human beings are likely the only animals who know about their impending death. Knowing about their death means also knowing that they have the choice to take their life. Their capacity to kill themselves likely makes humans unique within the animal kingdom. Yet humans will most often fight for survival despite overwhelming odds and despite physical and emotional pain, and this even though they are endowed with the freedom to end their lives. So there you have it. Nine categories that seem to capture something basic about both the light and the shadow of human dis-ease. And here's the remarkable thing. If we split light from shadow, looking only at the disordered, chaotic, and painful parts of human existence, we end up with the nine categories for borderline personality disorder. This fact 
that the disease of BPD mirrors the dis-ease of being human, makes our epidemiological quest to locate and cure this serious mental disorder one step more difficult. This fact that BPD mimics normal human experience leads us to the final problem regarding this silent, invisible, unidentifiable illness that spreads through our populace. Borderline personality disorder is so evasive, obscure, and hidden that it defies epidemiological research. No epidemiologist has been able to find it. They've searched the world over and cannot locate the disease. But surely the disease of borderline personality disorder exists. Clinicians have recognized BPD as a particular disorder requiring interventions specific to its unique nature. Indeed, guides and manuals on how to survive and even cure BPD are abundant today. Surely, there must be something there. Perhaps epidemiologists are looking in the wrong place. Remember, borderline personality disorder began with a term before identifying what it meant. And the categories that emerged from this novel way of locating a disease don't describe any one thing. It makes sense, then, that to investigate borderline personality disorder, we really should look at the use of the term and its spread, rather than any particular behavior or phenomenon. We could call this an etymological, epidemiological search. And, sure enough, when we conduct such a search, we find that the term borderline personality disorder is clearly growing in pandemic proportions. A chameleon-like disease mimicking normal human behavior, camouflaged by comorbidity and massive permutations that cannot be located by epidemiological methods and known only when we see it. The borderline illness is triumphant for now, avoiding our detection, yet affecting multitudes. Perhaps someday we'll discover the right words, the right phrases, to capture this wily disease. Until that day, if you're worried that you or someone you love may have borderline personality disorder, make an appointment to see a mental health professional immediately. Absolutely invisible. Well, he said, I see. 
not wanting to appear a fool, he added, Yes, indeed. I see it perfectly. It's beautiful. Isn't it grand? Isn't it fine? Look at the cut, the style, the line. The suit of clothes is all together, but all together it's all together. The most remarkable suit of clothes that I have ever seen. These eyes of mine at once determined. The sleeves are velvet, the cape is ermine, the hose are blue, and the doublet is a lovely shade of green. A lovely shade of green! Somebody said for the queen. But the queen came. And she was very told very quickly how all the wise people could see the... Mary Sue! That's right. And naturally, not wanting to appear a fool, she said, Oh, isn't it grand? Isn't it rich? Look at the charm of every stitch. The suit of clothes is all together, but all together, it's all together. The most remarkable suit of clothes that I have ever seen. These eyes of mine at once determined, the sleeves are velvet, the cape is ermine, the hose are blue, and the doublet is a lovely shade of green. A lovely shade of green! Some of the court to convene, and all the court came, and the ministers came, and the ambassadors came, and naturally, not wanting to seem like fools, they quickly agreed with the king and queen. So the king issued a proclamation as follows. <coughs> The suit of clothes is all together, but all together is all together. The most remarkable suit of clothes a tailor ever made. Now quickly, put it all together with gloves of leather and hat and feather. It's all together yeah. thing to wear in Saturday's parade. Saturday's parade! Leading the Royal Brigade. Yeah. Well, by this time, everybody had heard about the king's new clothes and that he was going to wear them in Saturday's parade. The people lined the streets as the artillery came by, and the infantry came by, and the cavalry came by, and the fife and drum corps and the royal guard, and finally the king. And everybody cheered, hooray! <laughs> because nobody wanted to appear a fool. Nobody, that is, except one little boy who, for some strange reason, hadn't heard about the king's new magic suit and didn't know what he was supposed to see. Well. He took one look at the king, turned a little pale, and said, Look at the king, look at the king, look at the king, the king, the king. The king is in the all together, but all together, the all together, he's all together as naked as the day that he was born. He's in the all together, but all together, the all together, it's all together, the very least the king has ever worn. Call the court physician, call an intermission. His majesty is wide open to ridicule and scorn. The king is in the all together, but all together, the all together, he's all together as naked as the day that he was born. And it's all together to Chile Amor.